folks. So we can um, probably get started uh, whenever you're ready. Okay, great. I want to thank all of you for joining us today for our second town hall of the 2020-2021 uh, school year. Um, as you know, we've been working with the guidance that's been uh, released by the Vermont Agency of Education and the Vermont Department of Health. But, um, by following that guidance, spread of COVID-19 in the school building, and reminding people that they need to stay home if they are sick, we should be able to have some success with opening up our schools. Reminding too that. No. Uh -oh. So Soph Hall is in Missouri in a parking lot. So we might have lost her connection. Sorry. Um, I, can, I can get going. That's all right. Okay, so and and I so I just wanted to apologize up front because Hope might be able to connect back in. But um, so if Ben, if you want to go ahead and get started, that would be great. And if Soph joins back in, we will um, have her say a little more. Awesome. Well, I appreciate you guys inviting me. My name is Ben Prevost. I'm a risk management consultant for Visbit's multi-line program. You may or may not have heard of us. We insure most of you, close to ninety percent. Um, our mission at Visbit is to protect the resources of schools. And the way I personally do that is through implementing risk management and loss control strategies. You know, every part of our lives, there's, there's risk, right? By getting in our car, driving to work, we take a risk. Sometimes we're conscious of that risk and sometimes we're not. But the real question is, how do we protect ourselves in a world filled with hazards, right? Especially COVID-19. In risk management, we use this tool here called the Hierarchy of Controls. I'm sure you have seen this out there already. Um, it's been around forever. It comes from NIOSH, the National Institute of Occupational Safety and Health, which is a program of the CDC. Um, this is a great tool to use when determining how to make our environment safe. So note the, that it goes from most effective to least effective control methods. Elimination being the most effective, right? If we could eliminate COVID, that would be awesome. Uh, and then PPE being the least effective. So let's use this tool by looking at how we can apply it to these isolation rooms and some other spaces that we may have. So I like to put the hierarchy of controls in sort of question format because it invokes you to come up with answers, right? And there's, there's gotta be a lot of thinking involved throughout the entire process in risk management. So for this instance, with isolation rooms, I'm going to skip over elimination, right? Because we can't really eliminate the hazard. The only way we could do that is if there was, if we were to say no one is allowed at school. Um, substitution, I'm going to skip over that too, just because really substitution is used when we're talking about chemicals, switching from, you know, har harmful chemicals to less harmful chemicals. Uh, and in schools, there's the Vermont School Green Cleaning Chemical Law, which some of you may be aware of. Um, there actually is a clause in there that talks about outbreaks. So really what you want to be using for chemicals right now is what's on the EPA N list as an N as in Nancy. And you can just simply Google EPA N. It's on the EPA's website. If you're looking for that list of chemicals, I'm sure your custodians and facility staff is well aware of this already and are already using chemicals that um, are approved by the EPA. Uh, so with isolation rooms, the most effective control method that we can implement is going to be our HVAC design. And I know I'm skipping a lot, but again, I am gonna skip over the HVAC design because I know that Rachel from Efficiency Vermont, from our Energy Investment Corporation is gonna talk a little bit about that. But know that an engineering control in this circumstance is your HVAC design. So I guess jumping back, jumping into the administrative control, controls, right? looking at tasks and procedures. 
That is what happens when we go from point A to point B. And it's good to set up sort of an assessment or checklist tool to guide you through the task and procedures. So, cause really we're thinking through, what do we do if we have a suspected case or a student with a fever coming in all the way up to the exiting process of the isolation room? Again, what happens between point A and point B? That's what we're thinking of when we're looking at tasks and procedures. And documentation of these procedures and tasks is very important. Not only is it helpful for you and other staff members, but also because it removes the guesswork out of it entirely. If you just have a checklist that you can go through. Um, with schedules, you know, we're looking at when is access granted? Uh, when are cleaners coming in? How often are they coming in? How long is the room open for? Who's scheduled to be in that day, right? And then we get into creating policy. Who's responsible? Who has access to these rooms? Who are the backups if, that, if someone is sick? Hopefully not from COVID. Do we restrict access? If we're restricting access to these rooms, um, we're gonna want signage on the door stating authorized access only. Install a door lock or some sort of access control, right? And you're gonna have to have conversations with your facility managers on all these subjects and really to make sure that you're not creating other hazard, hazards or code issues. Cause we still have, you know, for example, fire code that we still have to abide by. Are you blocking exits? <laughs> There's still all these hazards that we still need to think of and your facility managers are great resources for that. Um, other instances of signage that we're seeing a lot of is, you know, signage on the floors and noting physical distancing. That's an administrative control. And lastly, what are we doing for training? You know, what do you need to provide for training? Who's going to be trained? Who's going to be doing the training? And at the end of answering these questions, you wanna sort of bottle this up into a plan and train all of those involved in the process. It's a lot, right? So really having a plan is going to be very helpful. So the last question number five here, right? PPE, and again, it's our most least effective control method but it's what we have to turn to here as well. What are we doing to protect ourselves and others? And to understand what we need for PPE, we need to start by looking at sort of the means of transmission of COVID. So airborne droplets and contact will seem to be the three main means of transmission when it comes to COVID-19. Knowing that we start looking at knowing each one of these being a means of transition, we start looking at what equipment can help protect against these means of transmission. So I pulled some information from the CDC, right? Cause that's really who we wanna be following. And a lot of this information is somewhat geared towards healthcare facilities, but it's still pertinent when we're talking about isolation rooms. Uh, I got the website up there. I think I, I will definitely provide a PDF version of this to Clayton if they wanna distribute this after as well. Um, the right side, I'm not gonna go ahead and read because there's a lot of good information in there that you can go ahead and read later. But talking specifically about airborne precautions, this is a means of transmi transmission. So when we're looking at PPE, right here we're talking about N95s or face masks. When we get into droplets, we still have the face mask, but now we're adding the face shield and the goggles. With contact, right, there may be instances that you may have to contact, get in contact or get close or within six feet of someone who is suspected of having COVID or showing symptoms. So now we're adding gloves 
and gowns. At the end of this, this is what it looks like. This is the full PPE that you should have if there is a suspected case of COVID, if you are coming close in contact, you wanna protect yourself from airborne or droplets in case they sneeze or cough. So you have face shield or goggles, an N95 or higher respirator, an acceptable alternative according to the CDC is a face mask, a pair of clean non-sterile gloves, and an isolation gown. Now I'm sure being nurses, you're all aware of doing doffing, you know, putting on the gear, taking off the gear. I more or less just wanted to emphasize this aspect of it because sometimes you know, even in amongst the community, you see people grabbing the front of the face mask and taking it off. There is a controlled method of taking off your gear and putting on your gear. So I just wanted to make you aware. Again, I'm not going to go through each step. Uh, the website's there. They have great signage if you want to print this out and post on the doors of the isolation room or in the nurse's office or anywhere else. I uh, highly recommend doing that. But it would be even a checklist on the front of the door. Before you walk in this door, did you do each one of these steps? So I know this is kind of short and sweet, but there's risk everywhere, right, in life. My bachelor's degree was in facilities planning and management. That's sort of my area. And it always interests me to see how schools are always adjusting to their times to protect students and staff, right? Right now we're building isolation rooms and we're revamping our schools for COVID-19. Before this, we were upgrading our security measures, redesigning our front entrances, redesigning our traffic flow. Just down the road from me is a school that was built in the 1950s, right? Our schools are old. And that was in the Cold War. So the school was literally designed with a bomb shelter below. I mean, can you imagine designing a building to protect against a missile? I mean, those must have been some scary times. And here we are, we're in 2020. Again, designing isolation rooms. But we are a lot smarter now, I think. <laughs> because, it, it, but, and that's because of education, right? Education's important. So if you use the hierarchy of controls, to think through the various control methods that you can implement, then you are appropriately managing risk. There isn't a guarantee or 100% solution. Even Clorox wipes says that they kill germs up to 99.9%. .9%. You still have that 0.1%, right? Just remember that there's, there's no such thing as perfection, right? My motto is strive for perfection knowing it doesn't exist. So right there's my contact information. And I'm just realizing I didn't have my email up and it's just simply ben at visbit.org. But that's all I have for you today. Always feel free to contact me. And Rachel, I think you are next. So just bear with us as we transfer over to her. And as um, Rachel, as we're transferring from Ben to you, um, Soph Hall is back on. So Soph, if you wanna um, try again, uh, I know that your phone overheated because of um, how amazingly uh, hot it is there in Missouri, but if you want to um, unmute and try again, that'd be awesome. <laughs> okay, great. Um, I want to thank all of you for being here, and Ben, I appreciate your presentation. I will have thank to you. go back and listen to the recording, but uh, so appreciative of your wisdom and the way you set this up as a checklist for us. I think that's going to be very useful. Um, Rachel, I don't know how to pronounce your last name. <laughs> Mascalino. Mascalino is an air quality engineer and she's going to speak specifically to HVAC and what the air we're all going to be breathing will be like. Thank you again for joining us, Rachel. Thank you so much. Hopefully my screen share will appear quickly here. Someone could just give me a, a nod yep, that you're they good. can see. Okay, great. All set. 
Great. Thank you so much. I'm, I'm so, so appreciative to be here speaking with you all. Um, ben, I'm glad you turned it around a little bit from the bomb shelter. You were bumming me out a little bit there talking about schools being designed, but I am an that. eternal, <laughs> eternal optimist. And I, the first thing I, I'll leave with is that the work that we're doing now in schools around indoor air quality is going to is just such a significant investment in the health of all of the occupants of schools for decades and decades to come. This is the turning point where we're bringing visibility to something that has been so deferred and absent and invisible for probably, I mean, for the last at least 60 to 70 years in Vermont since all of these buildings were built. So um, there's a lot of positivity that's going to be, to be gained from the work that so many people are doing today. Um, my, my role, I'm a, a mechanical engineer. I work for VEIC, and the reason I'm, I'm here today is because I have been assigned to the Efficiency Vermont contract. Efficiency Vermont has been um, chosen as the administrator of the $6 million grant for indoor air quality for schools. So we're providing the technical resources to make sure that that money is being allocated towards schools um, solely for the intent of improving indoor air quality. I know there's a lot of grants and funding out there. That's the one that I'm focused on. So that's why you all have access to me. Please take down my email, my phone number. I love talking about how air moves in buildings. This is what I've been doing my whole career. And to be able to know that this is going to improve the health and safety of our schools is, is just so meaningful to me. I'm so thankful that there's an audience to, to think about this now. The goal of what I'm going to talk about is to explain the components of indoor air quality and the goal metrics for the areas in, in the school, including the nurse's office and the isolation space. But I really wanna talk about the foundation of what we mean when we say indoor air quality, and you're gonna be able to take that information, apply it to your specific nurse's station or isolation room or your school in general, and be able to have really meaningful conversations with your facilities management and your contractors about how to make improvements, no matter what your space is, I, I guarantee there's something that we can do to make all your spaces a little bit safer in a very short amount of time. A little bit of a delay here. Oh, there we go. So I also have the inverted pyramid chart like Ben here, and mine is more about the priorities of those engineering controls specifically. So the whole point of focusing on indoor air quality anywhere in the school is that we want to use the mechanical system to reduce that risk of transmission. And that's the, the piece that I'm really going to be focused on. We know that transmission is a function of intensity, duration, and frequency. And we want to use that HVAC system that exists in the school to address the intensity and the duration. That's, that's what I can help you control. Func the frequency is more of a function of, of the scheduling and how often people are in what spaces. But um, we really want to prioritize on ventilation first and then filtration and then that supplemental cleaning of the air. And if we look at breaking down what those words actually mean, ventilation is, that's how we're going to address the intensity of the exposure. So we want to decrease the intensity of any viral load in the air, whether it's, it's aerosols or um, the larger particles that are from coughing and sneezing. And we're going to do that by diluting that potential viral load with outdoor air. We're gonna make sure that any of our spaces that we're focused on have that minimum requirement. Um, there's a formula there. It's good to understand only for the point that there is a number that you can use. So you can take any room in your school or your nurse's office and you can tell me the square foot area of that room and I will tell you exactly how many CFM of outdoor air need to be put there. And then you'll be able to know, is it enough or should I have more? Filtration is the next step on the pyramid and that's what is going to tackle the duration piece. So we're going to decrease the duration of exposure by removing particles through a physical filter. And there's a lot of talk and technology that I could get into in terms of, of filters, but the, the main thing to understand is we're going to be recommending filters that capture 
the majority of the particle sizes that we know that the COVID virus travels on. Um, and I'll talk about some of those, those numbers specifically, but we wanna make sure that those filters that we have in place is a function of the air moving over them how often is that air moving over them or air changes and the MERV rating. So again, that MERV rating, it's not important that you understand exactly what that means, but understanding that there is a, a concrete number that you can ask your facilities manager or your contractor, you can say to them, what is the MERV rating in the, of the filters um, of the air moving through the space? And if they say eight, you can say, great, tell me what I need to do to get that um, up to a 13 or higher. And we'll talk a little bit about what those numbers mean. The spot purifiers is the last piece on, on the pyramid. And it's, it's pretty interesting, the correlation between this and what Ben was talking about in terms of PPE being at the bottom of, of his priority pyramid there. This is the last thing we want to prioritize because it's, it's very piecemeal and it's very specific and it's not an investment in the overall sustainability of indoor air quality in the building. So it's, it's a band-aid, it can be used, they can be very effective, but I, I really cringe a little bit when I just see schools saying, we've got 200 rooms, go buy 200 purifiers because you're not really going to get the impact of decreasing that exposure that that you might think and i so much of this is really complicated by the fact that it's invisible and i know that schools are drawn to those spot purifiers because they can see them and they can hear them and they can plug them in and they can point to something in the corner that's running and saying i have this thing my air must be clean and so so much of what we're talking about is so collaborative and it's, it's establishing that trust and that working relationship with contractors and your facilities managers so you're all on the same, same page to understand what you have now in your buildings and in your rooms and what is your goal and what do you want to get to. I, I will say that the, the HVAC elephant in the room is that we need to do all of this while maintaining the space at a comfortable temperature. And ideally, not, you know, ideally a, a comfortable relative humidity of, as well, which is should really not go lower than 40% in the winter, um, which is also a metric that we know will decrease the transmission of, of the COVID virus and all similar viruses in that family. The, the reason that this is tricky is because we live in Vermont and we heat our buildings for seven months of the year. And there comes a point when that, that top bar of that pyramid, that ventilation, you're going to trade the amount of outdoor air you can bring into a building for the human comfort. And we know that if we drive the temperature down in the winter, that's going to drive the relative humidity down and that's poor indoor air quality. So it's a constant balance and just so many interactive effects of, of this invisible force. But there's a lot of professionals out there and a lot of guidance. And I think if we understand the, the basics and the foundation of what we want our spaces to how we want them to act in terms of indoor air quality that we can, we can make improvements. So one of the things I was asked to speak to was the guidance and that's, um, you know, and my, my response was what guidance? There's a lot of guidance out there and there's a lot of engineering papers, there's a lot of HVAC guidance what I'm pointing most of my schools to, and I'm working with many, many schools on the facility side right now, is the Strong and Healthy Start guidance for Vermont schools, um, the June 17th. And there is a section, this is, I, I've copy pasted this directly out of that document. This is um, directly related to the, the nurse's office and that isolation room. So these are the bullet points that Vermont has said this is what we wanna focus on to make sure that nurses and students are safe. And the reason we wanna to, to capitalize on that is because everywhere else in the building, all of our indoor air quality work, that's all assuming there's someone in the building that, has, that is tested positive. If, if we knew that the only place someone with any symptoms was going to be was in the nurse's office or an isolation room, then 
then a lot of the other work that we're doing would go by the wayside. But we're treating the entire school as, as one box. That's where we've drawn the line around. And we've said everywhere in the school, we want to take precautions to make sure that the transmission risk of this virus and all future viruses is minimized. So this really doesn't feel that overwhelming to me. And I think that the, the examples and the questions I'm going to point out for you to ask are really going to help you key in on what, where you are in terms of this list and where you need to get to. The box on the right, the ASHRAE Epidemic Task Force for schools and universities, there's a section in there on nurse office general requirements. This is, I paraphrased this, so I took some of the meaningful bullets out of this guidance. Um, ASHRAE is a very technical HVAC focused organization that has, has really put out some phenomenal information regarding COVID and how indoor air can, can assist in minimizing transmission. But I appreciate that Vermont has distilled that information to make it Vermont specific. They've, they've taken that guidance and they know, they know what our schools are and they know the condition of our, our schools. And ASHRAE has written this guidance for every single school across the US. And we know that our schools here in Vermont are significantly different and, and should be treated differently than a mega high school in Phoenix, Arizona that was built two years ago and is graduating a class of you know, 1,500 students, which is not uncommon. So understand that digging into the ASHRAE guidance can, can quickly become daunting. And I would point to um, Efficiency Vermont and your local engineering resources who have really done a lot of work to distill that to make it Vermont specific. Let's see, I also have a note here that just to keep in mind when we're talking about HVAC systems, um, again, this, this builds off of what, what Ben was saying and it, we didn't even coordinate this at all, but the CDC has indicated that that primary mechanism for transmission is still person to person spread. The, the ventilation and the filtration can minimize the close contact and long range transmission and that's the the uh, emerging tech, or emerging science that we're hearing about the potential of spread through aerosols, but there there have been no confirmed cases yet that have been tracked back to transmission from one HVAC zone to another. Um, all of the transmission is happening in the same room in the same space from people who are positive and who are transmitting it to others who are within that six to ten foot zone. There have been spaces where people are not masked and it's, it's been transmitted further than that because air is being moved in that room. But those were cases where there was no ventilation, there was no dilution. So if you take that same amount of people and put them in a sealed room, that viral load is going to increase the longer they're in there. Again, so that's why that ventilation is at the top of the pyramid. We really wanna flush that, that room out and dilute anything that's in that room with outdoor air. So again, just kind of back to that priority one of the ventilation. I wanted to share a little bit of what some, some schools are doing that I'm, I'm talking to. They're, they're assessing, they're trying to figure out what do they have. They're working with their facilities managers, are working with their trusted HVAC contractors, and they're establishing those baselines so you know what you have, so you know what you need. As an engineer, it's always really concerning when I hear things like we need more, we need better, and I say, I, I want a number, like what is more, more than what? And people say, I don't know. So we've, we've got to baseline this. You owe it to yourselves and your community to understand what do you have going on right now to understand how you're meeting these requirements or how far you are from meeting them. Some of them, may, you, may, you may be exceeding them now. That would be under, good for you to understand as well. Um, some schools are doing a, a remote isolation room. So depending on how your school is laid out, this seems to be really popular. They're taking a small classroom or, their or an office that's near the exit. They're making sure that that room has a dedicated air source. Um, typically, this is a unit ventilator. That's the, the thing on the wall that pulls in a mix of outdoor air and recirculated air. And that's great because that's not going anywhere else except in that room. 
they're upgrading the filters and they're adding some additional exhaust to uh, make sure that that air is only leaving that room. It's not being pushed into adjacent spaces. And this is, this is a, a great solution that, that some schools are able to implement when you're not able to add on to your nurse's office as it, as it exists now, because we know all of those same functions are gonna continue to happen this year. Some schools are, are, don't have that luxury of having that space near the exit, so they're needing to take their nurse's office with an adjacent, um, you know, it's almost, I guess I'll call it like an, a, a triage room, and then they have an, a, an attached bathroom, and they're taking that whole suite of rooms, and they're, they're putting in a standalone isolation unit. This is um, a big thing that goes you know, the size of a small refrigerator that might go in the space, it's ducted directly to the outside. And what this is going to do is basically turn that space into give you indoor air conditions where you could you could perform surgery. It's medical grade, it's going to give you up to 20 air changes, which is the requirement for operating rooms. And it's going to HEPA filter the air, which um, is somewhat overkill, but it's a great filter option. And if that's what these are, are doing, that's great. These are expensive, they're loud, you're cutting into the building, and I consider these for worst case scenarios for, for buildings. I'm not saying they're not a good option, but it's it really depends on the scenario. So here's two extremes. Some people are finding a little room that they can isolate, and some people are saying, we need something right now, and our existing infrastructure of HVAC in our school is so poor, this is our only option. And there are contractors that can help you with those as well. So in terms of, of next steps, I think that understanding the pieces that we talked about today, that the priority is ventilation, filtration, and then some sort of spot purifier that you can add if necessary, if you can't get to where you need with those, those other two metrics. I, I really encourage you all to work with your facilities managers. I'm already working with them. We, we've got th over 300 schools as of this afternoon that have set an intake to us, which means they're interested in receiving um, our technical assistance and potentially some grant money to help them figure out improving indoor air quality in their schools. I'm, I'm talking to facilities managers for about five hours a day, every single day. And if you guys can jump in on that conversation to understand what they already know and how you can get control of this one space, I think that there's a lot of information there that is already really powerful that they'll be able to provide you with. I think if you can answer these specific questions, what is the volume of outdoor air being supplied to the space? What are the current number of air changes? What is the current filtration level? And be able to the answer the question, is my space um, being served by a central system or a unitary system? And with all of this information, if you have these answers on hand and you go to a contractor and you say, I want to make it better. Now they know what to make better. So as part of that, you want to define your goals based on your specific system, your budget, and your timeline. And this is where you really want to draw in a professional who can help you understand what's possible. That's, that's not your job. But we want to be able to understand if I have, if, if I'm meeting the minimum requirement for ventilation, how can I get 30% better? How can I get 80% more? Can I do 100% ventilation? And when do I have to start closing those dampers because it's too cold out? We wanna be able to control to those two modes of operation. All of this talk of HVAC in this extreme case is only when there is a symptomatic person present in the space. Otherwise, you can just operate as normal with meeting the minimum requirements of a classroom indoor air quality. There's no reason that the nurse's office needs to be any different than that as long as we're hitting that minimum. Understand what is your existing filtration, let's increase it. If you're at MERV 8, let's get to MERV 13. If you're at MERV 10, can we get to 16 or something more? And, and again, just getting better is going to trap a higher percentage of those particles that could potentially be carrying the virus. And increasing the air changes. That's the higher the air changes, that's just the more times that that, think of a piece of air traveling over that filter. And the more times that's happening in every hour, the more of that potential viral load you're going to be able to scrub out of the air. 
So figure out what you have, figure out what you want, and then go get a proposal. Figure out how you can work with contractors to improve your system, get a scope, get a cost, and submit it to me as part of your K-12 indoor grant application. And we'll be able to add that to all of the other work that your facilities manager is requesting for your school. And we'll see if some of this grant money can help cover this for you. And um, please do not hesitate to, to reach out to me. I've got a, a couple of other engineers who are working with me on this. Um, many of us are, are senior HVAC mechanical engineers who are licensed to even design systems in Vermont. We have a lot of experience and I'm so thankful that Efficiency Vermont was chosen to do this and that we can really allocate our resources to help you all get your spaces safe and that you can feel confident that they're safe. So with that, I will stop sharing and hand it over to Deb. Great, and Deb, as you're sharing your screen, um, I, I did post something earlier, but uh, I've seen lots of questions in the chat box. Um, we're, after, after Deb finishes, uh, we're gonna try to go through and answer some of those questions. Some of them may already been addressed. Um, we'll try to get the highlights off of what in the time we have left. And um, what we don't get to, we will be uh, getting answers to those and they'll be posted when we post the other um, items with the presentations as well as the recording on the BSSNA website later this evening or tomorrow morning. Okay, hang on just a moment and I'm gonna share my screen. So I was um, asked to present today just because I have been able to, and I, and I don't, it wasn't necessarily just me, um, I have a really supportive administrative team in my district. Um, as soon as the guidance came out on June 17th, um, we all met and developed a task force and took several days to go through that document and look at everything um, needed there. So <clears throat> part of, I think it's important that school nurses make sure they're a part of those conversations. Um, I don't know how many school nurses um, have been available this summer. I know it's a bit different than usual, that's for sure. Um, but for me, it was looking at all the data, the guidance that came out, um, and I did note that it's page 17 in that guidance. Um, and just as Rachel did, I copied and pasted the appropriate parts about um, that they had put in that document regarding what needs to be um, instituted for an isolation room. So we looked at that and we met, because um, I am the school nurse leader for my district. So I've been communicating with the other school nurses to get their input. Um, and we were brought in early on and also met with our operations manager, facilities manager. Um, and you can use all of this. I know I've heard from a lot of school nurses that actually were not um, getting anywhere with instituting isolation rooms. Um, so this is um, important, I think, for them to see and know on figuring out how to open up communication if they're not having those conversations with their administrators and superintendents. Um, this is another um, information for um, COVID funding. There has been some federal dollars. Um, we're just not sure how those will be disseminated yet, um, but this gives you some of that information as well um, on hopefully some funding that will be coming our way for schools. 
currently our funding, what our administrator and superintendent decided to do, we're actually kind of in a sticky situation right now because our budget was declined twice. So we currently, we don't have a school budget. So we're having to borrow to do anything within our schools this summer. Um, but they've decided that it's important that we open. And so they've decided to allocate funds for the isolation rooms. They also um, brought us in, each of the nurses in each of our six schools, brought us in to actually look at the spaces and give advice on the best location and maybe where other spaces could be situated or moved around. And th there's been a lot of change and it's a very stressful situation, but we also took into account that budgets are tight everywhere, um, potentially could get worse because of the decreased revenue coming in. So we worked together on looking at what's the best way to create an isolation room, but also the most economic way to do it. So it's not anything fancy, but we are um, putting up some walls and knocking down some walls. And to do the isolation room, we have to displace and move other personnel in the building. Um, so we're having those conversations. Um, this is a CDC planning tool. You can click on this link. Um, I think it's a really good tool because it doesn't go, it goes through everything, but it does have the isolation room within it. And it gives you some really good steps in preparing and looking at your resources and checking and rechecking. Um, and then of course, the Department of Health and the AOE um, and the links to the documents that are on there. School nurses can use all of these resources when advocating for isolation rooms. Um, so just going through making sure you're included um and some school nurses say they are excluded from some of the meetings with administration so i just always advocate that continue to send your best advice you're the medical professional in the building um and continue to communicate even if it is just one way advocating for best practice um there should be a reopening task force that's established because that was part of the guidance. Um, asking to meet individually with the superintendent if you're not in the group meetings with the task force. Asking to meet with the operations director um, and advise on effective isolation rooms. So we did have an engineer come in and, and for our district, our building is extremely old. Um, so one of the things we found out was that in the evaluation of our system, although it's not deemed efficient for heating, it actually brings in a lot of outside air. So it's actually good for COVID, but not necessarily good for efficient heating. Um, but we are not only putting in the isolation rooms in each of the six schools, we are also putting a vent directly to the outside from each of the isolation rooms. Um, we specify needing a half glass door so we have a window so we can observe if a student needs to be in the isolation room. Uh, we also have a plan that if by chance we have more than one person with COVID symptoms, then the secondary location would be outside. We have not yet, we're kind of just planning right now for the fall and we're starting from there, but then we have to continue to figure out a plan for when we get into those colder months um, and trying to figure out what that's gonna look like. And hopefully our budget passes and we'll know better what we can do for a temporary outdoor space. Um, there is supposed to be new health guidance coming out uh, this week. So depending on that, maybe things will change again as far as what we need to do for our schools. Um, but just making sure school nurses, as soon as you know, new guidance comes out to be aware of it, educate yourself. 
Um, and that's about all I had as far as the process for us. It was just looking at the guidance meeting. Um, I'm going to just stop sharing there. Looking at the guidance and, and meeting and making sure that those conversations are happening and being included on those assessments and you know continuing to build those relationships with administrators and superintendents um, and I think things as things have progressed I've heard more and more that there are more um, isolation rooms being created and worked on so that's good that's all I have Awesome. So thank you very much. Um, so the plan is that we are going to take some questions out of the uh, chat box. Now, I just sent a quick note to Rachel. Hopefully she saw that. And um, it was about the use of fans and different types of fans. So maybe she can start with that one. And, um, and Rachel, if you want, I can actually put that question and the way I stated it into the chat box for everyone to see. Um, and then maybe you and Ben both could weigh in on it. Sure. So okay. it looks like the the question was the, about the use of fans. So if we're just moving, so the difference between recirculated air versus ventilation, is that the yes. root of the question? Yeah, I, I, right. I believe so. That's what it seems like. Yeah. So think about it in terms, there's two components. Um, we want to if you're, if you're in a room, in a sealed room, and you're just moving that air around in that room with a fan, that is, that's bad. There's, there's no benefit to indoor air quality there. Please don't do that. All you will be doing is spreading the aerosols farther than six feet from one student to another. Do not just put a fan in your room. Um, Outdoor air is, when we say ventilation, we mean the air from outside coming inside. And we, when we talk about air changes, we're talking about the total supplied air through a mechanical system that is passing over a filter. So a ceiling fan or a box fan does nothing other than maybe feel good if you have air blowing on you. If you're really interested in increasing the air changes, so again, that's just the air that's moving through the room, that same air, you want to pass that over a filter, that's where those small portable units come in. If you know you're getting, you're not getting good air movement in your current system and you want to add air changes, these little filter units are great. They have high MERV filters. Some of them are HEPA units and you can get up to two air changes depending on the, the volume of the space you put them in. Okay, thanks. Um, so, uh, I'm not sure, Kelly, can, are you able to grab some questions then for them? Um, that'd be awesome. And you're muted. Okay, I'm just gonna start from the top that I got from the chat box. So first question was, can you please speak to the use of plexiglass in the classroom or in office? Um, so I'm assuming that's going back to the hierarchy of controls, that would be sort of a engineering control, right? You're protecting you against coughs, sneezes. I'm assuming that's more or less the question with the plexiglass um, or barriers between students in the classrooms. I mean, that's really all it is. I know people are fabricating their own, which is not a bad thing because when we talk about engineering controls, one of the big things about fabricating uh, barriers is particularly machine guarding um, it happens all the time people are constantly modifying their equipment in industrial environments manufacturing environments to protect workers ultimately that's the goal um, how they're fabricated you know wood plexiglass I mean as long as they're doing the job of creating a barrier between people Okay. And um, uh, so if I could just um, ask this question very quickly to either Rachel or Ben. So the, um, the fans, there's still some questions. And I, and I think there's, uh, there was another one uh, that Elizabeth Worth had asked also. So having window units. So if you have an, a one fan in the window that's bringing air in and another fan that's putting air out. So you are exchanging air. 
that may have some effect on the HVA system as it is, the load, um, how, how that would work. So that's one question. But two, can, do you have to have both an in and an out, or can you just bring air in and, and maybe the HVAC? I know that's a building specific question, but that's a lot of what folks are wondering. We have some rooms that have no fans at all or no windows. That makes it more complicated. But really with the fans, it's the in and out, I think that's um, creating some concern for folks in a, several different ways. Sure, so if you've got two windows on each side of the room and you put one a box fan and blowing air in and then another side of the room, you've got a box fan blowing the air out, right? So that would be ventilation. That's, that's, bring, that's your outdoor air. And outdoor air that's brought into the building always needs to be removed. You can't just fill a building up with air. It's gonna go somewhere. It's not always through an exhaust fan, but there are it will this it's not a sealed exactly sealed box but that air will will go out through a designed mechanical system we like to des, we like to know where that air is going so we can actually control it and and quantify it but um yeah if you if it's the fall and you've got windows open and you're moving air in one side of the building one inside one of the room and out the other side yeah then you're essentially creating increased ventilation um, you just want to make sure that you're not battling something, some other overarching mechanical system that's going on. If there is cooling or if there's filtration, right? We, we want to filter recirculated air. There is no point in filtering outdoor air. That's, that's the clean air that we want to breathe. We don't want to use these expensive filters on that. Thank you. Okay, so next question is, in the absence of ideal ventilation and or windows that can open, is the use of a standalone filter purifier recommended or of benefit? It is of benefit, absolutely. Um, do what you can to get some ventilation in there. If you've, there are many schools in Vermont that have heat and windows. So they have radiant heat, they have no mechanical ventilation system, we've got to get those installed in our schools. We were talking upwards of a quarter million dollars for a small school for these type of systems. But if there's not one in there, that's where we need to be. The minimum standard is 10 CFM per person that's in the building and 0.12 CFM per square foot of area. And that's in the middle of the winter. That's the minimum amount of outdoor air that you want to mechanically be bringing into your building. So use this as a kicking off point to get those proposals and get that system scoped so you know what you'll need for your system to bring it into compliance for your entire school. A standalone system in the meantime, yeah, you're gonna get, you're gonna at least be able to clean the air that is trapped in the school in the dead of winter when the windows are closed. Mm -hmm. And I think you pretty much just answered this. It's a um, similar question, what should we purchase? If a small office space needs an air purifier, one without a window or fresh air coming in just has an exhaust. So. If there's just an exhaust, that's, that's interesting. We do have um, an approved or a recommended list of these small purifiers. Again, you're gonna still gonna wanna size them. There's no easy button or widget that you can just buy and put in any room and it's it's really gonna the answer is always it depends and so we would need the volume of the room and how many air changes that's going to achieve and there's a list of energy star rated units um, the filters are they will expire so if the if the maintenance is deferred on these units and you buy them and plug them in and ignore them they will be a total placebo effect and just be a box making noise in the corner so Again, just we need to manage expectations of the stuff that we're buying to provide solutions to ensure that it's a sustainable solution going forward. So next question, are air conditioners safe to use? They're safe. They don't, they don't do anything other than cool the air. They, have, they do nothing for indoor air quality. A, a window air conditioner just recycles the air that's in the room and cools it. And is it okay to have an isolation room without ventilation to the outdoors and with no window, but with a HEPA filter? I, I don't know if I'm qualified to say that it's okay. It's, if that's the best you can do, then that's great. Um, 
again, the, the goal here, so many of our schools are so deficient. These, these guidelines that are putting out, are being put out are some of, for some schools, they're, they're pie in the sky aspirational. If you have a room with no ventilation and no windows, and that's the only space that you can uh, um, assign for an isolation room, then yeah, just make it better than what it is. Put a, put a big air purifier in there and make sure you're getting six to 10 air changes. And that's, that's gonna be the best you can do in that situation. And is it okay, or um, there's been so much emphasis on opening windows. However, open windows will affect the functioning filtration systems, which are set to function to provide optimal airflow. Any thoughts? Um, yes, if those systems are running when the windows are open, right? So uh, you, need to, you need to be in touch with your facilities manager to understand the overarching strategy of how air is being moved through the school. If you've got a centrally ducted system and you're opening windows, um, it, there could be interactive effects. So again, I recommend having that conversation so you understand what's going on in your building and not only in your building, but in the specific room that you're, you're questioning about opening the windows. So you understand um, what that's going to do in terms of your indoor air quality. Is it going to make it better or is it going to make it worse? Or is it just going to not matter? It's just going to use a bunch of energy for no benefit. I'm not sure who wants to answer this one. Um, what should you do in the absence of an ante room? Of a what room? Um, an ante room. An ante? Like yes, a course. place to don and doff. Um, oh, gotcha, gotcha. PPE. Before yeah. you enter, after yeah. you exit. Yeah, I mean, there was some guidance on that those CDC documents, right? When we're talking about airborne, I think it said take off after you exit. When we were talking about droplets, it says take off before you exit. So there is varied guidance on what you do there. Um, obviously you want one, but do, do what's best in your situation. I mean, if you can set one up, set one up, but again, it, it, it's about managing risk here. Mm -hmm. And, um, my opinion is always what's the safest option in that scenario. Do we take it off before or do we take it off after? If we're taking it off after, who are we exposing in that scenario? So it, 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 again, it's circumstantial. You really got to think about your scenario. And I'm happy to have these conversations with people to talk about your specific scenario. Um, but again, it's it, you got to have the conversation and you got to see what you have available for resources in your mm -hmm. environment. Okay. Next question is, if isolation air cannot be mixed with other space, does that mean curtained off isolation spaces are not acceptable? Curtained, yeah, a curtain is not a, an air barrier. Um, a curtain is not an air barrier. You can't, you can't monitor any pressure differential between one side of a curtain and another. So you would have to like in a hospital if you think of a, 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 a hospital room that has a curtain down the middle and there's two patients in that hospital room there's two different supply and return um, diffusers that the air will there's a designed air path just putting a curtain in a room without uh, understanding the design of how the air was intended to flow in that room would not necessarily um, be be effective in protecting anyone on one side of a curtain from another. Mm -hmm. Okay, and um, this one's a question followed by a comment. Are HVAC systems tested daily, weekly, or monthly? Public school buildings have been neglected for decades, and it feels like now more than ever, we'll continue to place band-aids on what feels like a bleeding artery. 300 schools who are interested in grant money and air quality improvements with a statewide school start date of 9-8. Seems like an upside down approach. 
So this is, remember, these are the buildings we've all been putting our children in and working in for the last however many years. Um, this is, we're, we're talking about the, the worst case scenario compared to the best case aspirational technology that's available for brand new buildings being built. We, we, were all, we will all continue to occupy buildings going forward. Everyone who's entered a grocery store in the last four months has taken that risk without understanding the HVAC system that's going on in there. Any building that you walk into, these just because it's not perfect does not mean that that's a barrier to occupy a building. Mm -hmm. um, unless you literally have not left your home and you have all of these in this technology in your home for anyone who else who enters it, these are, these are aspirational, these are guidelines. It's good to have parameters and metrics and hard numbers to work towards, but it's not an all or nothing. We, let's take what we have and make it better. And the fact that th there will be schools that will open in the fall, just like there are buildings that will open that we will all occupy and send our children to that do not have these systems in place. This is a starting point of what I see as a decade long initiative to bring visibility to our, our aging infrastructure in Vermont. So I agree with the comment, but again, we're all going to continue to occupy buildings and let's use this awareness to make sure that as we're making these investments, they're not band-aids and that they are sustainable and meaningful improvements in our, in our spaces we're occupying. So, so to speak to this awareness that Rachel kind of touched on, Vermont schools, we, we haven't had school construction aid since probably 2008 when the housing market crashed in the previous recession. So there has been some advocacy groups, Vermont superintendents, it was working with the Vermont School Custodial Maintenance Association to bring back school construction aid. There was conversation and still is conversation on that. What that's going to look like, I don't know. Um, I think... You know, Douglas administration way back in Vermont had a good school construction aid program and had a great program for building new schools, but we haven't seen new schools in a long time. Uh, but know that there is conversations in the legislature and hopefully we can turn things around, but they are costly endeavors. Mm -hmm. And when we keep having recession year, <laughs> years after years after years, it's, it, it's a growing problem. And the other the other thing, Ben, to add to that is that a year ago, nobody cared about this. So we can point fingers as to why this has been so deferred. But a year ago today, nobody cared about ventilation in buildings in general. Now we care. Now there's visibility. Now we'll work forward to fix it and look for the funding to be able to support that. Correct. And I mean, there hasn't, there's not a lot of regulation on indoor air quality. You could start to see new regulation on indoor air quality that would force this. Okay, let me see. Um, there were there were a couple of kind of question comments about the what some confusion about the isolation room. This is not the room for only COVID kids. It is the room for the sick kids to go until pickup. I guess, I mean, maybe I'll just address this one. It, the answer to that is an isolation room is for any student or staff, if needed, that has COVID related symptoms. I don't know if anyone has anything related to that. It was a little, a little unclear what those, I don't know if that addresses those comments and questions. And I'll, yeah. I'll add that um, Soph actually um, did mention that if you have someone that has symptoms, they're being dismissed. So um, anybody that has COVID-like symptoms are gonna need to go into that isolation room until they're picked up. So, and Dr. Holmes has spoken to that several times, um, but and we we're in a pandemic, so we're treating it as the possibility um, of COVID. And the, the silver lining to that possibly could be is that if people are answering, answering the questions before they come into school and they are already being um, tagged as having a fever or having other symptoms, they won't be in school, therefore we won't have to send them home. So, uh, and we're hoping that if that's being caught before they come to school, the amount of folks will actually have to put into isolation rooms will be reduced. Um, and the other part of that is trusting that we have um, parents and students that are going to um, 
understand that we're in a pandemic and having fake symptoms just to get out of school um, is going to make things harder for everybody. And we all deal with that all the time, but um, hopefully that helps somewhat too, is we're hoping that most of it's screened out before they ever get to school. So our isolation is really for something that's a fairly sudden onset that'll be responded to with isolation until they can be picked up. You could potentially put them in a room that's separate and with an N95 mask on and just wait there. I mean, regardless of any ventilation, remember that's not the answer. Nothing is 100%. It's just a, a tool to decrease the potential of transmission. And we know that it's, it's those immediate large particles that are the highest potential for transmission. So if you've got nothing, have some good masks, put them in a room by themselves, 10 feet away from other people and wait. So next question, um, if the room is large enough to accommodate more than one person such that they can be at least six feet apart, can more than one person be in the isolation space if needed? And again, I know we've heard from Brina Holmes that no one person per isolation space but again, I don't know if anyone's heard any other thoughts on this. I guess what I'll say is if you start getting multiple students who are showing symptoms that you have to bring to the isolation room, then you're getting to a point where you need to start making phone calls to outside groups. It could be an outbreak in the community, right? And this is where things completely change. You know, you call your local health official, whoever you're working with at the schools, and you're saying, hey, I'm getting too many popping up. I mean, if you're getting over three or four or five, you know, I don't want to say an exact number to where it becomes an issue, but you should start to recognize if there is an outbreak in your area. Because an outbreak is different than one or two kids with the sniffles. Um, and obviously with Vermont and it's 20 seasons, <laughs> um, it can change by the season. So you just got to be aware of your environment and what's going on and kind of take it from there. And it, it, there is judgment involved. And Sharon Lee, did you want to add to that? Cause you had um, uh, indicated you might want to speak to that a little bit. Thank you, Clayton. I, I just think these speakers are amazing and the expertise that they bring is stuff that we've all been looking for. Um, so I really want to thank them. And remember that their focus is on the mechanics and the process and their expertise. And we have a different expertise. And I really appreciate Leah's comment um, that our incidents, the data, we're using the data. Otherwise, we wouldn't be moving forward to school is so low that it's unlikely to have a COVID related illness. However, um, I agree. Let's let our, our experts on um, the ventilation system move forward, but mm -hmm. more comments on the illness itself next week. Thanks, Sharon Lee. We have a few more questions left that I think we can fit in here. So um, next one is regarding use of air purifiers, if this is something that is best, is the best we can do, do we only need to turn this on when there's someone in the room? Can it be off otherwise? Um, so if there's, if there's anyone in the room, um, I guess I'm just drawing on a, a conversation I had with a, a nurse and a facilities manager and, and her office where her desk was, was adjacent to kind of a first aid room and they were purchasing a unit for her office and a lot of these have two speeds or more so she was going to run it at a, a minimum speed which would provide two air changes just because of their mechanical system and how they were um, breaking that off of the central system and then if there was a student that came in she could turn it up to six air changes which is um, the the minimum requirement for any sort of symptomatic child or um, any nurse's station versus uh, an office. So it's, it's, it's totally up to you. I would, if there is anybody in the room, I would run them on low speed. If there's more people in the room, turn them up. Great. Um, thank you. 
Thanks yeah. very much. Um, so we are um, down to like just the last few minutes, and I know that there's questions in the in the chat box that uh, were not addressed, and we will work on getting um, answers from those. Rachel and Ben, uh, as well as well as Deb, all said that they would look at those and try to provide some um, additional guidance that we can then post on the website um, to answer those questions. Um, and so. Uh, what we wanted to let you guys know, and there was some questions in here about this specifically. So, so the plan for next week is addressing, um, Dr. Lee and Dr. Raska did a presentation earlier this week uh, that went into detail about um, the, uh, and Sharon Lee might be able to speak more directly to what it was about, but it had to do with research that's been showing um, that students, or children under 10, um, can transmit the virus as much as um, over 10, uh, 10 and above. And they, uh, they were able to provide a fairly uh, detailed um, discussion on how uh, that's being misinterpreted. And, um, and so we're going to have the same presentation from them. And there may also be uh, some additional uh, slides. In early, in early in this, Dr. Lee and Dr. Raska did a presentation for the Grand Rounds that was very excellent in explaining um, just COVID in general and what was going on. And we're hoping to get an update on that also. Dr. Holmes is uh, planning on speaking to uh, if you have COVID in school, what's going to happen. We might not have specific document to be released, but she's definitely going to talk about how that process may look. Um, and we are hoping with fingers crossed that the AOE releases the updated guidance from the June 17th document. And so obviously if that happens, that will also be included so we can maybe hit the high points since both Dr. Holmes and Soph Hall, our president, are on that team and they can discuss, discuss those. So um, stay, stay, you know, stand by for those. We know that, that you know, every time we have to wait a little longer, we, you know, we want to know everything now. We don't have all the answers yet. We're trying our best to get, um, VSSNA is trying our best to help coordinate and get information out as quickly as we can. We just want to, uh, again, say thank you to Rachel, Ben, and Deb for uh, being here with us today, um, answering questions, providing some scenarios, and um, providing information that we as school nurses can take back to our facilities managers, administrators, principals uh, for further discussion, and just having um, names and email address, um, addresses that we can actually uh, give to them for them to contact is, um, is really, really great and, and helping us move forward. So, uh, we are, time is up now, so thank you everybody. Um, we really, really appreciate um, everyone joining in and we look forward to seeing you again next week.